sounds tough. <laughs> Not as tough as dating me, huh? Is dating him tough? Greetings comic lovers and welcome back to Casually Comics, the channel where we chat all things comics, from movies to comics new and old, to history to anecdotes, really wherever our whims take us. It's time once more to explore the Tim Drake bisexual story arc through a myriad of lenses, as many angles as possible. DC may have shoved him aside when they leaked John's coming out in time for coming out day, but I didn't forget that Tim had a date with Bernard. I've waited months and now time for recording, it's here. And there's a fair bit to talk about. Now if you keep up with online comic book drama or news or both, you may have heard that Tim Drake, Robin at the time of this recording, well one of, came out as bisexual. Although if you read the story it came across much more as a questioning, a decision to explore one's sexuality. So more a soft coming out, for there are many different ways to come out. And the discussions surrounding it are changing, both outside of the LGBT community and within. Point was, things were changing for Tim. There was much made of this change, some even rankled at calling it such. Claiming that the demon of change or retcon was viewing things through the lens of heteronormativity. Others felt coding had always been present, and this was just bringing it to the fore that it had been implied. Others felt that some creators had done that, but others hadn't. It wasn't quite as clear cut, and that also sometimes things could be misread. And then people could even come in after, and then choose ever reading made them look the best on the creative side. So some felt this was pandering or tokenization, which others found genuine. And some wanted to wait and see where it went, and hope that this meant that something would finally be happening with Tim, who had moved from a powerhouse character in terms of side characters to one who had become displaced by other newer characters. And one who seemed really lost in the shuffle. He'd even lost his own identity and was back to being Robin. Of course, not all loved the idea of a character's sexuality being altered, particularly as some felt it was only done to make him more interesting. And others still felt that the person stepping forward to be a romantic interest came out of nowhere. Why Bernard, who was a character from Tim's solo series back in the day, but why not some fan favorite pairing, like say with Connor, if they were going to go this route? That's Connor Kent. That's to say nothing of breaking up Stephanie Brown and Tim off panel, especially when their relationship had finally gotten to a good place. And there was no in-universe explanation, leaving you only with the metaverse one. Basically, the metaverse explanation is one that can be explained for reasons or rationales outside of the narrative itself. Some felt that she was simply removed because she would have made it complicated. Well, of course, it was noted he could have been dating her and still come out as bisexual or decide to explore his sexuality. The comic book series wherein the story is being tackled is Batman Urban Legends, an anthology series that is occurring adjacent to the main Bat books. And the things that transpire within are canon and being influenced and influencing the main canon, which is in general a bit hard to track time for recording because of what's going on with the Omniverse, wherein everything is canon, but also there is still a main canon you must follow. The initial storyline where Tim began to explore this side of himself, as well as, or rather more so, have a massive existential crisis about being Robin and what he wanted his place to be in the Bat family were in issues four to six in a tale called Some of Our Parts, with some spelled S-U-M, not S-O-M-E. So some is in total, not as in unspecified amount. It was written by Megan Fitzmartin with art by Bell and Ortega. The final issue of this initial storyline was released in August of 2021, despite the cover date being October. I hate when they do that. Just make the date the date. And this follow-up was released in December of 2021 in issue 10, cover date February 2022. Either way, four months in between those issues, so plenty of time to percolate and sit with it. Now in that time, a couple of things had shifted, largely on the marketing front. As mentioned, John Kent also came out as bisexual within the span of a few weeks, and then most of the attention shifted over to him, rather than splitting attention between the two. Because I guess marketing and PR operate on Highlander rules. There can be only one. Now there are a bunch of concerns surrounding the story direction for Tim. And while some did come from negative spaces or places of bigotry, that was not the case for all. And so some other concerns could find themselves dismissed or lumped in with more unsavory critiques as a way to not have to address them or to diminish them, invalidating them by conflating them with something much more negative. Though of course, some could be both. Even when some of those claims came from within the LGBTQ plus community itself. For no community is a monolith. All communities have disagreements. Everybody comes from different subject positionings, experiences, locations, so many factors. Some even take issue with the usage of the word community at all. There are different sects within groups, S-E-C-T-S. -E so you're always going to have a variety of opinions. For all people are people, regardless of what other traits they may possess or identify with. One of the concerns for Tim was that he would ultimately still end up being pushed aside and that this change would ultimately not do anything to change his ultimate position at DC, which was floundering. And for some, how quickly he was forgotten after John Kent was pushed to the floor was indicative of that, where others would have been more optimistic. Issue six ended on the promise that he would explore his relationship with Bernard. It actually ended on them agreeing to go on a date together. The articles and interviews with creatives involved in this story insinuated, or in some cases flat out stated, that this was a huge moment for the character, that it was something they were proud to be a part of. As a result of that, it very much placed this segment of the story at the fore, positioning it as potentially the most important factor, making it the foreground above the other struggles Tim was going through with his identity. Because identity is multifaceted, and while some may identify more with one aspect than another, a narrative grants 
you the option as the one in control to either do that or focus on all aspects equally at one's leisure. So issue 10, I will not bury the lead. There is no date. There is no real exploration, just as how there was no explanation as to why he broke up with Stephanie. Off panel. Now he's just in a seemingly picturesque perfect relationship. Off panel. Well, on panel for a little bit, but as to how it got there, what they're like together, just no, off panel. Bernard, time of recording, is alas not a character, but a cardboard cutout made of pure understanding and support, which may sound ideal, but it's not necessarily executed in a way that's engaging, but comes across more as apathetic or overly cautious. Particularly with how this aspect of the story was treated or how DC seems to have allowed the narrative outside of comics to be spun if it was never intended as the focus, but rather as the background. Now, of course, it's just one story and it ends with the promise that Tim Drake will be back in 2022. So there is always potential to flesh this more out. This is one short story in an anthology book after all. Now, this story had a lot of scrutiny upon it. Granted, less than it would have if John Kent hadn't come out a few weeks later, but there's still some. So what do we get? Well, this story is a very mixed bag. Some parts of it land and others do not. And in some ways, outside of the relationship with Bernard, Tim's sexuality is nicely, subtly, and naturally in terms of how characters react to it and the place it takes in the story handled. A lot of how the story is received will depend upon how engaged you were with the extra material surrounding it. So say YouTube videos, online discourse, be it on social media, or potentially press releases or interviews if you were aware of any of those things. Or if one was particularly excited to see this aspect of the story highlighted. So with that long cold open aside, I'm Sasha. And if you're enjoying this content, you know what to do. Hit that like button, hit subscribe button. Let's talk more about Tim and Bernard and Batman and all kinds of things. Batman Urban Legends issue 10, the holiday slash Christmas issue. Now this is a continuation of the first video. So we're not gonna cover everything we did there. We're not gonna recover issues four to six and we're not gonna go into the same detailed overview of Tim's history. We're gonna focus on issue 10 for the most part. And as always, we're gonna cover a lot. So stick around to the end because we're gonna be having points all the way through. Such so discussion, much video. Batman, Robin, Tim, I have to specify because there are multiple Robins running around simultaneously at this point in DC, time of recording, are soaring above the Gotham skyline. And Bella and Ortega, who did the cover, adds snow. It's a nice touch and everybody does it. And so the style is recognizable because she did the art for issues four to six. Now this story is still written by Megan Fitzmartin, but the art inside is now by Alberto Albuquerque. And it is a jarring difference from Bella and Ortega's art, which stands out all the more because she did the cover. Now artist changes are not uncommon time of recording, and especially in an anthology series. However, this new art makes Tim look as though he's about 13 years old. Your mileage may vary, I found it jarring and it took a while for me to thematically connect these two stories in my mind. I got there and by the end it was all cemented together, but at the start I was very much like, huh, that is a very different art style. This story is very much tied to the ends of Joker War, more specifically Fear State. You can get by without having read all of that, but the whole reason why Bruce is struggling and falling apart is tied to that, as well as why he has less money. There is a handy dandy editor's note for where to go if you're lost as to what's happening. Once more, like the last Robin tale by Fitzmartin, there's time jumps. We're rocking back and forth between the present and a few days ago. It's not really necessary. It neither harms the story nor accentuates it, as any potential scenario parallels are just stated verbally by characters later on. It feels more like a kind of aesthetic narrative choice than a story-based one. Bruce has been struggling since everything went down in Gotham. He's beating himself up and he feels that he's failed the city and he's running himself ragged and getting hurt more often. Tim is concerned and has been looking for a way to cheer him up or help snap him out of it. So he comes to him with a case that he's been working on saying they can work it together like the old days. This story is very much a character piece, as was the first one Fitzmartin wrote. That one's centered entirely around Tim. This one is more about his relationship with other people. His relationship with Bruce, his relationship with Nightwing, Nightwing and Bruce's relationship, as well as Bruce's relationship as Batman with Gotham. In fact, the least amount of relationship it has to do with is him and Bernard. A few days ago in Bloodhaven, we got our only bit of actual Bernard in this story. Tim calls him to say that he has to deal with some family stuff, so he has to miss their date and he's gonna be out of town. The way that he's talking, he's very much in secret identity mode, so it doesn't look like he's told Bernard he's Robin. So for those who thought Bernard knew, no, it doesn't appear that he does. Remember I told you about Dick? He's He's like my older brother. Now, Bernard is barely present here, which is a shame because Bernard was a character. He may have only been in a few issues back in the 2000s, but he was presented as a close friend who hung out with Tim on the regular and also talked about how hot Tim's stepmom was on the regular. Tim Drake's stepmom had it going on, according to Bernard. There was an opportunity here to play with some things they actually did like to do together. Instead, we get something a bit more generic. Sounds tough. <laughs> Not as tough as dating me, huh? Is dating him tough? Does he regularly cancel dates? I wouldn't know, because everything happened off panel. Maybe Gwenpool was watching from the white space and she can tell me what happened. Tim, don't worry about it. I miss you, but I understand. You do what you need to do and I'll see you later. 
I just want you to be happy. That last bit was a tad intense for a regular conversation about a regular canceled date. I just want you to be happy. Like we're just gonna meet at the Tim Hortons now or later. I just want you to be happy. I know Tim has been having problems. Does Bernard know? How long have they been dating? Who else knows? Please tell me things, Issue 10. That's the thing, Bernard. I think I am. So why do I feel like this? Like I'm waiting for it the other shoe to drop. I don't know, and I still won't by the end of this issue. So that's our Bernard for this issue, minus one time he's mentioned at the end in one more panel. Now there's multiple ways to read and take this. So let's go through some, and of course, if you have a different take, leave it below, you know I wanna hear it. Tell me. This could have been exactly what some wanted. Nothing overblown or sensationalized. Just something gentle and ordinary. Happy, seemingly drama-free. Working this relationship into Tim's life rather than having it be the focus, which was a concern some had during the initial arc, that Tim would cease to be a full-fledged character and become a character who is only you utilized for issues around their sexuality. So some may feel this is a good way to continue this and present it as a journey, while not ignoring or deprioritizing the other things that Tim has to work through within his life. Like, will he ever get his own code name again? However, for others, this may not have been enough for a variety of reasons. For one thing, it's such a blip that one could actually omit these panels or make some subtle changes and one wouldn't even know that they were in a relationship at all. It also would do nothing to alter the story at all if they were together or not. This exchange doesn't have much bearing on Tim's ultimate mindset in the story or the story itself. So for some, that feels far too safe, trying to present something as inoffensive as possible for those who may have been offended. Some may feel this is almost hiding it, that because this is so new or because it made so many waves, it needs to be more dealt with front and center more overtly. Others would have expected more because of the publicity surrounding the initial issues and again, the discussion surrounding it. Here are some quotes from when the reveal occurred. My goal in writing has been and will always be to show just how much God loves you. You're so incredibly loved and important and seen. Forever grateful to be trusted with Tim Drake and his story and honored to work with the amazingly talented Bella Ortega and Loki Sun Alex. I fully sat on the floor of my apartment for a solid two minutes in happiness as it sunk in. Ultimately, this wouldn't have happened without champions at DC like Dave and James Tiny in the fourth, and I hope it is as meaningful for others as it has been for me. There's been a bunch of conversations about whether or not he's been queer coded throughout time, and this just felt like the piece that was missing in order to understand Tim Drake's story better. When press releases, the few that there were for issues, 10 because again, after John Kent, things and buzz around this issue really dried up. The continuation of this storyline when it was said to be circulated, Fitzmartin had this to say. The response to Tim's story has been more than I could have hoped. It's always exciting to share Tim's journey with fans and close 2021 with this special holiday story in Batman Urban Legends number 10. Here's how a preview in November featuring a solicit described the story. Written by Megan Fitzmartin, the feature length story, A Carol of Bats, feature length, features art by Alberto Albuquerque Jimenez, pencil slash inks, Nick Filardi, colors, and Pat Brousseau, letters. This continues Tim's journey of self-discovery from Urban Legends number six and sees Tim balancing his drive to fight crime with his desire to be a great partner. Amidst the ashes of a devastated Gotham City and Fear State, Tim comes back to Gotham City to help Batman and Nightwing try and put the city back together again. After its devastation at the hands of the Scarecrow and the Magistrate, along the way, Tim tries to get Batman out of a Scrooge level funk where the Dark Knight has serious doubts about if he's failed Gotham City and if its citizens will stop being scared and angry enough to have hope for the future. Now the official blurb on DC's official page since the story was released is quite different. Tim Drake goes to make peace with Batman before he leaves Gotham. The end full stop. Cut, print, cut it out. Now in retrospect, it would be possible to read some of the quotes in a different light. Perhaps looking at like those who worked on this officially on the project kept their responses positive but vague and more generalized about identity, allowing others to fill in the gaps. Which happened even from sources like the official DC blogs, which had things to say like, queer readers have continued to see a piece of themselves within the boy wonder. Queer readings of Robin continue to proliferate through his stories. The moment that a Robin, any Robin, but particularly a Robin with history, and now decades of queer coded readings under his belt was allowed to be the queer icon he's always been. To the numerous articles on websites and extra attention on LGBTQ plus websites, there were videos galore. I had one. I was part of it. <laughs> so as a result, this part of the plot, Tim's sexuality was allowed to become the focal point. Although some may feel that that is not a fair assessment, they feel it would have been inevitable. Was all this blown up because of online discourse or something? It should never have been. Now some feel if this was only going to be a couple of panels, something should have been made more clear to the tune that this was what one small part of the story. Just as it stood at that moment, that perhaps it would be more explored in the future because there was gonna be more Tim. 
in 2022. I'm going to hold you to that time of recording. Because after everything, there were people who went into this excited and expecting more. Some were really hoping to see this explored in depth, or at least more of Tim actually pondering and coming to terms with something presented as a realization to himself, and something that was contentious for many readers for a variety of reasons, and again from within different groups. There are still Connor Ware people. Let Tim Con live. So for some to have it feel like Tim just dealt with everything off panel feels a little bit dismissive, and also calls to the fore how Stephanie was cast aside. Why break them up if Solil was going to be done off the bat with this new relationship? Why not have a proper breakup and getting to Reno Bernardo? Though some argue, in fairness, one has to work with the space and time they are given. And Tim isn't exactly a hot commodity right now, and these stories are taking place within an anthology series, so they have different constraints. There are, of course, some who would love to see Tim get his own series again. We'll have to see if that happens. I'd like that. I want a series for everybody, though, so. We talked about Tim Drake's impact as Robin in the first video about this, so if you missed it, I'll link it down below. Back to the present. So what happens in this story if there is no date. Here's our plot. Religious places of worship are being looted across Gotham, across denominations and faiths. With Gotham out, it's because of the magistrate and fear state, the police haven't really had time to investigate. So Detective Williams, who was the detective from the last story arc, called Tim. They need someone who will help them not someone will shoot them. I don't trust the GCPD not to shoot anyone. I think Tim is supposed to be happy to see him. They had one of those instant bonds where Williams gave him sage advice that worked well from a sentimental level, but from a character level turned him into a walking trope. But the art just makes him look mildly confused. And say goodbye to him too, because he's gone. Bye, detective. I actually would have liked to see more of him. I like seeing supports get developed. Now we're hopping back to a few days ago. Tim has gone to talk through Bruce's mood with Nightwing, who is fighting Tusk. But he's clearly not somebody they take seriously because they just quip over him. I can't hear Tusk without thinking about the movie task. A walrus saved your life? Why are you doing this? Are you really mourning your humanity? We've seen Tusk. Tusk is terrifying. There's a really good scene here where it highlights how smart Tim is. That detective side of Tim, that slightly obsessive side, where he's able to recall the building's weak point because he studied both Gotham and Bloodhaven's architecture. It's really solid and makes Tim feel distinct, highlighting some of the traits that set him apart from the other Robins. But unfortunately, Nightwing is less on point. Nightwing, first floor by the window. What? Robin, what are you thinking? You're not Batman, said Dick to Tim Never. Now this line does not really feel like it adheres to the long history and closeness as well as respect Dick has for Tim in his role. It's very much happening because we're meant to be playing with a through line from last issue where Tim said he wanted the mantle. Which again was an interesting choice because there have been storylines where Tim has indicated the exact opposite. Some feel Tim is the natural Batman successor. This is our segue back to the present where Batman is talking to Tim, where he says Nightwing is right, so they're supposed to be playing off of each other those two lines. But if that line didn't work for you, the segue won't. If it did, it will feel like a decent transition. Back to the present. Bruce is lamenting the fate of Gotham, how it always seems to be struggling no matter what he does. Nothing will fix this city. The people of Gotham aren't just scared. They're angry. This exchange where Batman and Tim talk about Gotham is really interesting, with Tim coming to the realization that he may not be willing to give as much as Bruce has to Gotham, and that Bruce needs to stop beating himself up so much. It's a really earnest and loving look at the dedication that Batman and Bruce have to the city of Gotham, and the kind of inherent tragedy in it, from its inception to where it's gone. Some of it is clunky, as it's meant to time with the ultimate question of can Tim find happiness? Or rather, why isn't he happy? If the wind didn't make you happy, what will? Asking for a friend? His name is Tom Druck? The mob of angry citizens have arrived to rob this church. Which means, of course, that it's time to flash back again. Where they're now just doing Tim's plan with no issues. So the You're Not Batman line didn't really alter anything in this battle. It was just there for theme. Tusk is defeated, and Nightwing has a good moment with Tim, where he discusses that Tim can't be the person to pull Bruce out of his funks and depressions. That Nightwing had already tried to be that person, and that anything that seemed like progress would only be temporary. Because that sadness comes from within Bruce himself. I'm also making this sound far more deep than how it's expressed at points. Dick flip-flops between being incredibly insightful and being very flippant. I wrote this book already. Bestseller, book of the month, celebrity book club, the whole thing. This sentiment ultimately comes through though. We can't make him be happy. I love Bruce. He's family, but I couldn't bring him out of the past. Dick talks about how Tim needs to accept this so that he can move forward to his own future. And that Tim has gotten comfortable being Robin again after Damien left. But that that's Damien's role now. You deserve your own future. I mean, he already had one. He was Red Robin. I 
I don't know why DC seems to hate that so much. Drake, is it the burger connection? Were there too many burger jokes? Also, way to reignite the Tim Damien beef. I know for some of you, the flame was never extinguished. And on that note, back to the present. Batman diffuses the situation and confronts the mob leader with a hug, a bat hug. I want a bat hug. And he talks to him about doing something to help people rather than destroying more lives, doing what they can to uplift instead. Oh my word, compassionate Batman, how I missed you. This will land for some and not for others. Some will find this wildly OOC out of character. While for others, it will harken back to the more emotional depictions of Batman in the 70s and 80s, or even the Batman animated series from the 90s. Some of this does have actually very strong vibes for one particular episode. I Am The Night, where Batman is run down the anniversary of his parents' death. Dick is the one who tries to bring him out of it in that one, but ultimately it's Batman's love for the city and the fact that he sees that he can do some good that brings him out of it. I think I always worship Batman a little because my dad worshiped him. It's easy to forget Batman is just a man. Even now, Bruce feels larger than life. He may have more demons than Dante, but he won't give up. They set up a soup kitchen and refuge in the church and go get as many people as they can find. It would have been even more if Bruce still had the same amount of money that he did, but he doesn't anymore. They do acknowledge this in the story, which is nice, because Bruce did and still does use his money to help the people of Gotham. This could have been Gotham wide, but he doesn't have that kind of cash anymore, so it's gotta be one church. It's been an interesting journey for Bruce and his wealth, time of recording. Some see Bruce, see his money, and deem that as inherently problematic. Not always with attaching story beats to follow. Full demonstrate, instead of relying upon assumed subject positions and viewpoints to carry the day. Some do, some don't. Depictions vary. You can make a case for either. But like with any story, the devil is in the details. That's what'll sell it. To more people, there'll always be people who are willing to fill in the gaps, but you can't always assume they're gonna fill them in the way you expect. Once a story is out there, it's out there. The interpretations will vary. Anyway, here is an example of where him having more money would have actually been more helpful and had more of an impact. Still, they did what they could and made the city just a little better for those struggling in it. And Bruce and Tim talked, and Bruce agrees that Tim deserves to be happy. They then talk about Bernard. One more Bernard mention. Bernard was a friend of yours from school. I love that's not a question, just a period. Batman knows. He has like a Rolodex full of all his children's friends. Right, yeah, I think I've always kind of known. I mean, it's hard to have personal enlightenment when you're battling supervillains in tights every night. Some will read this as a direct response to the criticism that was levied against the first story arc. The idea that this wasn't hinted at properly within Tim's history. Which mileage varies based on whether people are looking for concrete things like plot bubbles or subtext or coding. So some felt that Tim had not actually indicated interest in male characters in his past explicitly. Now for some, this explanation will fly. For others, it will feel potentially insulting and like an attempt to excuse a blatant character shift or poorly executed character development. As some will note, other characters have managed to have much introspection and cues, direct and indirect, while still fighting crime every night. Now, of course, some feel you can alter a character at any point, while others feel that even if you do so, the history is owed something. Some form of honor, be it by sticking to it or by taking the time to showcase that it mattered by having the story feel like an evolution. Now, of course, some will never be receptive to a change like this, but some argue that those types of critiques should not be the focus, but rather that telling a compelling story should be, that nothing speaks more loudly than a successful and enjoyable story, something that on the whole leaves a net impact of that was good. And that by focusing on haters, it ultimately gives them more power. And sometimes it can give them more power than the groups one is claiming to uplift. Or people who are just enjoying the story as is and are on board with any changes. Side note, some of the haters came from within groups that some wouldn't expect or anticipate. The more discussions people can have, more people can be understood. And that doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be agreement, but it does mean that there'll be less of people being silenced and feeling frustrated. And that silencing can happen even within marginalized groups, including by other members of the groups themselves. There are many forms of power out there, institutional, situational, economic, interpersonal, social, regional, industry-based, just to name a few. Power dynamics are always shifting, changing, society is moving, nothing is stagnant. Everything's always on the move. Atoms and worlds colliding. And then again, some people are just jerks. There are hurtful and bigoted critiques out there. There are also thoughtful ones. While difficult, a story can be at its strongest when one can differentiate between the two and potentially take the more solid critiques to build a positive relationship between everybody. Company, author vision, fans, as best as you can do. While others feel there is no path forward until all bigotry has been eradicated, or at least is no longer outwardly expressed or capable of being outwardly expressed. What we're discussing is critique, not harassment or abuse, which are entirely different animals. Anyway, Tim was explaining Stephanie. She and I were due for a long talk, but he makes me happy. He does? That's nice. I'd like to see that at some point because you've been miserable this whole story. I also hope that he's not just a doormat who just lets Tim do whatever and is always pleased with whatever Tim is doing to avoid potential backlash. For some to not respond well if less depicted relationships seem to be coming across in a way that could be connoted as in any way negative. So some may face the fear that if a relationship is depicted in a less than ideal way that they will be accused of homophobia. While others feel a lack of representation in the LGBT dictates that all relationships be portrayed as positive. While others feel that like any group, 
there should be all types of relationships. There's rooms for everything because like any other group, relationships vary. There are good relationships and bad relationships. On another note, I also hope that some books stop acting like Tim and Stephanie never knew each other ever. Strangers who met at a bat family meetup. He can still be close and have a complicated history with her and be with Bernard. We then have a really nice moment between Tim and Bruce where they exchange gifts. You won't have to try to make me happy, Tim. I am happy because you're my son. That's very sweet. Celebrate with a bat hug, a bat hug for Tim. There's no time because there's crime. Maybe he'll hug some more criminals. Tim Drake will return in 2022 and he better because he owes me and Bernard a date. This story is a mixed bag. Now my approach to this work was very analytical as it presented itself as a tale that was set to tackle issues based upon the first storyline. which dealt a lot with themes of self-identity and doubt. That in the way it was discussed in the online space lent it more to a more in-depth analysis than say DC versus vampires. Although if they make Superman a vampire, we have to reconsider that. Gonna get some conspiracy boards out. This story suffers from its length. While the first story had three parts and much more time to get into Tim's headspace, and had moments of truly conveying self-doubt and did feel like Tim was at the forefront, this by contrast does not have those many moments for Tim. As a result, many things are simply told to us. Tim is unhappy. Tim is in a perfect relationship with Bernard. But there's a lack of fleshed out detail, emotionally and plot-wise. Bernard's role feels minimized, though that may be because of all the noise surrounding how Tim would explore his bisexuality within this story. As mentioned, this may completely land for some. While for others, moments like the I've always known may feel like they actually contradict the first story arc, which felt more like a gradual real Realization, or that was how it was received by many. Mileage will definitely vary and passions may run hot. These kind of topics can be approached from a variety of ways and mean a lot of different things to a lot of people. And as always with these topics, people can be having different conversations on top of each other and it can result in a bit of a fraught landscape, especially with the state of online discourse time of recording. And I guess just discourse in general. One of the other things to note is that Tim is in the exact same position at the end of the story as he was at the beginning of the arc, minus now being in a relationship with Bernard instead of Stephanie. Is he leaving Gotham? This story didn't really explicitly state that. And again, if you were only following this, you would be a bit lost as to what exactly Tim's place is. What mantle does he want? Again, not fully explored here. The whole I want the mantle idea didn't really go anywhere and it could have since the main crux of this issue was his relationship with Bruce and defining his happiness against Bruce's as a way to avoid his own feelings. What is Tim's future as a character in the DC universe? Still up in the air. He still doesn't even have his own code name or costume after this time of recording. Now this could all come together with a really cool story arc and this will just be looked at as the foundation and it may either be strengthened or weakened by what comes after. Tim can deal with a bunch of things, even while battling supervillains in tights every night. It does hit a little flippant. Remember how he saw his dad's corpse? Just describing it the way it is in the story feels very dismissive of the damage done to not just Tim, but everyone. Not only throughout his history, but even in the Fear State arc that just occurred that is tidying this up. Snark lands for some and not for others, as well as do little things that seem like subtle jabs inside of works. Again, it may not be that, but it does have the potential to be read that way. How are you when a story constantly inserts sarcasm, even to introspective moments. Fan, yay, nay, depends. There's a trick to it. Merry Christmas, Robin. Happy holidays, Batman. The art shift, while jarring, I did ultimately adapt to. Personally, it is not to my taste. Too blocky and the perspectives and character sizes shift a lot. Miles varies though, especially with art. Some parts of the story did land. Some of those emotional beats about letting go and having to try not to fix others really held weight. And you could tell it would have hit even harder if the story had a bit more time, of a longer arc, even just the three issues like the first part had. It feels as though the author prefers to place focus on these aspects, at least in Tim's stories, on the emotional lives of the characters with the action events are in the background rather than the other way around. For some that works, for others they prefer the latter, while for others it all depends how it's written and if it feels balanced or is in keeping with itself. I have talked for long enough and I want to hear what you think. I have so many questions. Tell me things. Was this what you thought this story would be? Do you like it? Was this how you wanted Tim's bisexual journey to unfold? Did you want more? Did this answer questions about Tim's place in the DC universe? Were your fears confirmed? Whatever fears they may have been. What do you want to see out of this storyline? Do you feel DC did this story a disservice by hyper-focusing on Tim's sexuality in the press? or allowing that to become the focus? Or do you think if they'd said anything and attempted to say play down that that was going to be a smaller part of the story, they would have been met with backlash? Do you think they should lean into it more? Do you want a bat hug? Have you been distracted by the fact that there's paint on my arm this entire video? I'm renovating. Just anything and everything. Points you feel I missed. I especially want to hear those. We can have discussions and they can be productive and even fun sometimes. We try. I really appreciate all of you who took the time to stick it out to the end. Thanks as always for coming on this comic book journey and for taking this day I spent discussing comics with me. I always appreciate it. Please do all the YouTube things. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and hit that bell notification so that you never miss a vid. I will see you again soon. Bye-bye.